Good evening, everyone. My name is Vernice Miller Travis, and I am going to be your moderator over the this evening. And so a lot of people have come together um, to uh, to really pull off what is going to be an extraordinary convening. Did you all have a good time today on the on the tour? Yeah. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be with you. Um, I had just incredible work to do, which kept me from going with you. But I hope that what you saw, what you experienced. Um, will stay with you for a very long time and help to power you as you think about what you want to do in your careers and where you're going to go. Recognize that there are people living in circumstances like what you saw today in every corner and every quarter of this country, right? And they all need good legal representation. So um, let us get on with our, with our conversation for tonight. So we thought we would start with a panel with some um, incredible folks who have been doing this work here in North Carolina for a long time, and let me introduce our panelists. First, we're going to hear from Omega Wilson from the West End Revitalization Association, our, our, our dear and long-serving friend, Omega. <laughs> then we're going to hear from Ryan Emanuel. Um, Ryan is a member of the Lumbee, uh, the Lumbee Nation, the Lumbee Tribal. He's a a tribal member of the Lumbee people right. here in North Carolina. Yeah. He also um, is a part of the North Carolina State Department of Forestry and Environmental uh, Resources. So y'all can clap for NC State folks, right? <laughs> we are also going to hear from Omari Wilson from the Land Loss Prevention Project. Um, and full disclosure, I serve on the board of the Land Loss Prevention Project. So He's especially special to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to give a shout out to the executive director of Land Loss, Ms. Savvy Horn. Yeah. And then we are going to close with the inimitable Ms. Naima Muhammad from the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. Mm -hmm. Omega, get us started. What's, what's going on? What's the political context? Is the work getting easier or harder? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, both. It's both. Um, I'll start off with, with this context. Our organization has been around, the Western Revitalization Association has been around for uh, 25 years. Uh, Amori grew up in that organization with a little section that we call Career Pipeline and Dream Network for Youth and Young Adults. You know, this is a long time ago. And it was elementary school, high school? Yeah, right. And, and part of what we were trying to do with our organization, which fits right into what we're doing here and what we've done a lot of in the last few years, is a legal part of it. Uh, we recently did a, a workshop with the uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, my wife and I, in December. And they want us to talk about this whole the legal part of it and how you make the legal and the science part works. And part of the issue we were dealing with in our community, a lot of the things that people wanted to research on us, from Duke University professors to Carolina professors, they wanted to do a lot of research, but they didn't want to go to the next step. What do you do with the data? What do you do with the results? What do you do with the pie charts and bar, bar graphs and all the things and all the people you've interviewed? And most of them did not want to go that direction. We wanted to use the information like CSI, like law and order. Uh, you don't collect data just to uh, create white paper to get dusty on the shelves. You want to catch the crook and the criminal. Uh, you may not be able to do it in an hour, but law and order has been on for 20 some years. <laughs> and so we've been operating about, <laughs> about the same amount of time. So you catch a whole bunch of crooks. We thought we were looking for one crook, but it turned out we had a whole a lot of people who were legally responsible in um, what the former administrator at EPA referred to our situation in Meb and Bernice and I were in, in that meeting along with a lot of other of our, well, a small group of our, our EJ partners from around the country. She said, our community deals with an issue that is not only complex, but complicated. The complex part of it is law and getting people to deal with the law and understand it. It is complex. 
And uh, as my son, Amorius, told me more than one time, sometimes when I ask legal questions, it's another department, it's another vision, it's another area. You know, it's very divided, just like an institution is. The, uh, and understanding and how to use it and how to operationalize it. The other part of it has to do with the, the complicated part is a former administrator described as how people do not want to follow the law, even though they know it's there. And we have called that in our meetings with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is challenging the old South. It's a cultural thing. Uh, the Civil War is over with, but people are still fighting it. You, you can see them. It's on TV. I get a dozen stories on my phone every day about monuments, uh, concrete monuments, uh, bronze monuments that people do not want to move because they want to maintain the Old South culture. But the ones we were dealing with were not concrete monuments that stood in front of the courthouse like in Graham and Alamance County where we live. We were dealing with living, walking monuments like mayors, city councilmen, police officers, fire officials, state officials, government officials, or just about anybody uh, that worked for local government who just wanted to keep the old South the old South. They didn't want to sit down at the table and negotiate any kind of corrective action in our communities related to highways, water and sewer disparities, lack of paved streets, outhouses in the city where people were paying taxes for 35 years and still had outhouses. <coughs> Excuse me. They wanted to say things to, to stay basically the way they were. So even though there were laws in place to deal with all this stuff, so our efforts in our organization grew its strength and notoriety and recognition to the federal level across the country and out of the country based on how we leverage the law to get some corrective things done. So we've been doing that with some success. And of course, we've been helping other people, <coughs> excuse me, helping other communities uh, learn how to address that and approach that. We, have, we were here last year at the symposium. We've been in North Carolina Central University Law School over the years. We were at Yale three weeks ago, my wife and I. We've been at John Hopkins University. We've been all over the country telling people you have to use the law. You may not solve all your problems. And of course, we have a lot of lawyers in here who look at the strategies to leverage legal action to do corrective things. I'll stop there, you know. You still got five minutes. Oh, I got five minutes? Yes. You want to talk for a while? Yes. <laughs> I can't believe it. This Na never happens. Na Naima cuts me off at three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll add this part. Uh, this has uh, been an interesting last few years because more and more people who are legal professionals or lawyers, law schools, uh, like the symposium last year and other meetings we've been in, um, have contacted us and asked about some of the things we did using the law. I'm not a lawyer. My training educationally is a communications person. Radio, TV, film, broadcasting, media, that kind of thing, starting in the 1970s uh, when we were in undergraduate school in Bowling Green State University in Ohio and Shaw University right around the corner from here. But uh, <clears throat> they were saying, well, what, what did you do? How did you do it? You know, we, did, we did not go to court to get a moratorium on the interstate highway uh, in our community changed a billion dollar highway corridor uh, we saved 70 some houses, we got roads paid, we got people on water and sewer, 100 some that never had been connected to the water and sewer even though they were only two blocks from the sewer treatment plant. We got um, sidewalks installed, we got people on uh, boards and commissions with the state to provide citizens input. Same thing with local government. We were encouraged to get some level of integration with some of the departments. Uh, people of color and some women. We filed administrative complaints. And this was a question I asked the people at Yale University when we were there uh, for the Reb Law, 25th anniversary of the Reb Law Conference. And there's some people in this room who were at that uh, meeting. There's one gentleman right there raising his hand. And um, I asked them did they know about administrative complaints and several of the people raised their hands about how they operate and how they work. 
basically, for some of the people in the room that may not know, we looked at the detail of the documentation. City councils, the attorneys, planning boards filed documents to say, when we plan to build this highway, we actually talked to the community. We actually had public meetings like we're having, you know, similar to this. And we, we asked the, uh, okay, we asked the, the Department of uh, Justice to look into whether or not the Department of Transportation actually had documents to show these meetings. They were not there. They didn't exist. And of course, the administrative complaint process shows that federal government agencies at the federal level had approved funding millions of dollars to build highway corridors and do other things in the city. And the documents the city officials and county officials and state officials sent in saying that they had gotten our input, community input, were, were false. There were no supporting documents. The administrative process says, look on page 14, box two, check CB2-4 and see if that document is attached. And over and over again, we combed through these voluminous pieces of paper and found out all of the testimony, and it's testimony when you put it, your name on it, it is classified as legal testimony, were false. And as a result of that, we got a moratorium on the interstate highway. It was on there for 16 years, and we didn't go to court. All the paperwork was written by us. Now, the caveat to all of that is we got death threats by local city officials. We got office visits by the police chief and police officers on a regular basis. Um, so that was part of it. We got people on our community member meetings they were part of our group. They were visited at the house at 9 or 10 o'clock at night by white citizens who wanted them to back away from our organization and back away from me. We got people who were questioning my wife's employment as a public school teacher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on and on. But the process meant that you had to upgrade the administrative complaint, constantly revise it, because very often the local government officials would send statements in and say that they approved, they had done this, they had done this and done this in order to get the federal money flowing again. Police cars, a lot of other things that they wanted. But they had not. So at one point in time, Department of uh, Transportation invited us to Washington, D.C. right after President Obama was elected to ask us to verify that in fact, the city council and the state government had done what we had asked them to do as a part of our complaint. And guess what? They had not. They put another moratorium on it, and another moratorium, and another moratorium. Turned out to be 16 years before they started building the highway project. And by then, they actually changed the path to save 70 some houses, put water and sewer in with block grants, uh, detoured the project with a big, we call it the elbow. It's a big C, a big loop straight. Now it's like to avoid just so much destruction on the community. All that was done by the administrative process, okay? So that's our legal legacy, and now we're teaching it at law schools all across the country right now. All right? That's, is that my 10 minutes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I want to start by acknowledging that we're, we're sitting here tonight on um, indigenous lands. So the, the Saponi peoples and the Tudlo peoples traditionally lived here. Uh, today, their uh, descendants are the Okanichi band of Saponi, uh, the Saponi and the Halawa Saponi. So those three bands uh, surround Durham on three sides. And for those of you who are on the tour today, uh, you're traveling through part of my uh, contemporary and traditional territory, Lumbee, and also my relative tribes, the Waccamaw Suwan and the Koheri. So that's our territory. Um, and my, my mentor, Ms. Donna, is going to speak more about that, I think, tomorrow. But I want to focus on um, uh, another threat that you, you may not have seen or may not have noticed today. Uh, two years ago, uh, Tribal governments and indigenous organizations in North Carolina asked if I would take a look at a brand new draft environmental impact statement that was issued for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Uh, I'm a hydrologist, so I said, okay, I'm gonna look for these water issues. I'm gonna look at wetlands. I'm gonna look at stream impacts, things like this. I got no further than the executive summary, and I came across a really puzzling statement. It said, 
environmental justice populations would not be disproportionately affected by this project. I said, how can this be? Because when I see the map of where this pipeline tracks, and it tracks roughly along Interstate 95 in Eastern North Carolina, uh, the map that comes into my mind is the map of where our tribal nations live. And I know that there are a lot of vulnerable communities uh, in Eastern North Carolina, but the ones with whom I, most, I work most closely are my tribe and the surrounding tribes. And so I dug into the meat of this a little bit uh, on behalf of my brothers and sisters. And uh, I found that, that there, wa there was no support for that claim. In fact, the, the support was, uh, was what you might call a false negative. So a false negative is when you go and have a, a medical test and they say you don't have the disease, but you really do. And it turns out the vast majority of environmental justice tests that are used in these types of federal permitting processes uh, are actually uh, forms of false negative results. So decision makers are, are, uh, are making judgments on environmental justice implications based on negative results for tests that aren't sensitive enough to detect what they're after in the first place. And this is not news to any of you who have worked in this area for a long time. Uh, but what I found was that there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. So we found this effect here. We found this effect here. We found this effect here. But we've yet to see uh, a, a deep explanation of why. So uh, I worked with some collaborators at, at NC State, uh, and we spent about a year uh, working on a numerical model to explain why, and we're trying to push uh, that model over the last hurdle of peer review right now. Um, and I'm hoping that it'll be something that the communities I work with can use to hold up whenever the um, uh, these tests come in the next time and say, your community doesn't exist. You're not here, you're not disproportionately impacted. Uh, we're doing this research so that, um, uh, you know, so that we can hold something up and say, no, you know, the reason why your test comes back as negative is because it's not sensitive. It's, it's basically designed to fail. Uh, and so that is, that is way outside of my comfort zone. Um, you know, I'm working on the very edge of my knowledge and expertise, but I'm doing it because I've got the support of my, my mentors and my community who have put this faith uh, in me to, to, to push this work to completion. So I'm, I'm, under the, I'm under the gun to get this done because at the same time, we know that this pipeline and other pipelines are working their way through first the regulatory process and then legal proceedings. Uh, my tribal government, the Lumbee, attempted to participate in the regulatory process uh, through the mechanism of tribal consultation. Uh, we were denied the ability to give formal input through consultation by federal regulators who said by the letter of the law, we only have to consult with American Indian tribes that have full federal recognition and fall on this list of 570 federally recognized tribes. Lumbee people make up the largest uh, American Indian tribe east of the Mississippi River. We have 60,000 enrolled members. About 40% of them live within the federally defined study area for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. So along the entire 600 mile pipeline route, there are 30,000 American Indians who live in the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission defined study area. It's an amazing number. Uh, there's no other infrastructure project proposed or in construction in the United States that, that affects such a large number of American Indians. Yet in the narrative uh, for the federal decision-making process, we effectively do not exist. In fact, in the draft environmental impact statement, if you, if you did a word search for the word Lumbee, you came across maybe two instances and they were, they were the names of soils and that was it. So by the time the final environmental impact statement came out, there were a handful of other nods to Lumbee and to other tribal nations, uh, but there is no uh, substantive input. So where does that leave us? What can we do? Uh, what, can, what can you all do? Um, I'm, I'm looking at you all who are the, the future environmental lawyers and advocates uh, to come alongside uh, tribes like Lumbee uh, and the ones 
whose territories you cross through today, uh, that can be a hard, a hard bridge to cross if you're an outsider, right? Uh, but there are ways to respectfully approach communities, and a lot of them involve building relationships first. We're relational people. Uh, we want to build those deep connections. And so, you know, what, what may not seem like um, productive work in our fast-paced Western world is actually extremely important. Just the act of building friendships and building connections and finding out why projects like this uh, are meaningful, why, why we care to have input at all. And so I hope that some of you will have those conversations uh, with communities like mine through the course of your, um, through the, through the course of your career. Uh, if you want to engage scientists like me, uh, I, would be, I would be happy to, to try to navigate this process. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a total dunce when it comes to, to, to the legal process, right? I can barely navigate through the regulatory um, process. I just want to throw a bunch of publications at it and then walk away, right? But that's, that's not how we make things happen, right? So I, I want to... I want to work through this using your levers and mechanisms as well. And there are other scientists who've expressed a desire to do that as well. So I think that there are, there are many people who, who want to work in this space, and we need to figure out how to build collaboration so that we can do that. Um, but I'm all for doing it in a way that's respectful of our communities and respectful of these, um, these relationships that we need to build in the beginning. And I'm just really thrilled uh, to be here in a space where, as Ms. Verney said, we're elevating um, communities and putting communities first. So that's, that's really important to me, and thank you for letting me be part of this. Omari? Okay. Um, so my name is Omari, and I'm, I'm here very happily representing Land Loss Prevention Project. And uh, just to give you a little background on, on what we do and who we are. So we were founded in 1983. I'm just going to hold this in my hand. Uh, in, in 1983, by the Association, North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers, in response to this deep concern about the steep decline of the number of small farmers and minority landowners in the state of North Carolina. Now our mission is to provide technical support, legal assistance to financially uh, distressed and limited resource farmers and homeowners throughout the state. And we do that through uh, community education, mostly through outreach and workshops, um, such as today, uh, legal, legal assistance and representation and training, uh, community economic development, and policy advocacy to address legal and economic problems associated with the loss of land by farmers and homeowners. So um, when we're in this space, we ask ourselves, how can we affect, uh, how can we help front, uh, affected frontline communities, EJ communities, prepare and recover from disasters. So when we look at frontline EJ communities, those are communities of predominantly of color trying to survive, being forced to live in close, close proximity to hazardous industrial land uses. So in these ad adverse health effects that these communities, communities experience, as a result of being subjected to noxious waste products and hazardous land uses and polluting infrastructure in particular, CAFOs and solid waste disposal sites that you saw, some of which you saw today, um, are being compounded when disastrous weather events arrive. Uh, climate change is only making these storms worse, and wetter and, and stronger with unprecedented storm surges. They give cumulative uh, impact to the potential for c contamination by animal waste that already exists and is, harsh, uh, is a harsh reality for these communities. And we see that in the form of uh, flooding and sea level rise, um, storm surge and high winds, heat waves and drought extreme precipitation. Um, frontline communities have, even before all this, before we talk about EJ, EJ issues and, and, and climate change, frontline communities have been in danger tr traditionally um, through the model of land ownership that we see in communities of color. So land ownership is a, it's a foundation of wealth creation for many individuals and communities. Uh, it can be a foundation of business and used to support the acquisition of capital to start and fund a business. Uh, land ownership holds ties for family and community, as well as financial health and, and independence. Uh, land ownership means different things for different people, uh, but the retention of the land is, is what is all the more important. 
Um, usually when we look at communities of color, we're seeing heirs property in communities of color. And it's a, it's a kind of tenancy in common ownership of property. Uh, tenancy is in common, uh, is ownership is the most widespread form of common ownership in land in the country. And heirs property is a kind of tenancy in common that we see. Now, and it's highly insecure structure of ownership due in part to the danger uh, of uh, partition actions. So uh, heirs property is, you know, it's common important in, in, in disadvantaged communities because of the lacking of estate planning that's, that's existed. And that's, that has, definitely has a racial element to it. Uh, the lack of legal assistance for communities of color because they couldn't afford it. And, and the lack of trust uh, for, for, for attorneys in, in those communities. Um, and it, it's in, in urban and rural. Um, and we, we see it, it's a problem when we talk about disaster relief because we can look at the no, lower ninth ward um, and uh, when, when Hurricane Katrina came through, a lot of those uh, residents were found uh, ineligible for state and federal disaster relief because they couldn't prove clear title to their property. So areas property is a, it's a problem. Um, but there's, there's some, some help on the horizon, uh, so we shouldn't lose all hope. It's called the, the uh, Uniform Areas Property Partition Act. Uh, and it's been enacted in 12 states, including South Carolina in 2016, which is Okay, um, <laughs> and in the eight other, eight other states has been there's there's it's uh, been introduced, and there, there's a there's a, a growing push for for it to be introduced and enacted in North Carolina too. Um, and a, a a part a part of that that bill uh, was included in the uh, in the in the new farm bill that came out just just at the end of this year, 2018 farm bill, and that that, that language in the farm bill is called the Fair Access for Farmers and Ranchers Act. Uh, and it's important because it adds heirs property language to the statute that will ensure more farmers, especially African American farmers and farmers of color, operating on property on land with undivided interest can secure farm loans now and they can access USDA programs, help them uh, to enable them to protect the soil and water, to uh, continue to operate viable farms that feed their communities and to pass along farming vocation and farming the farmland to future generations. That's of vital importance. The initial language, I'm gonna toot my own horn a little bit, but well, not me, but my, my people. Um, initial language was developed by the Rural Coalition uh, with its partners and members, including Land Loss Prevention Project, uh, Federal uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, the Oklahoma Black Historical Research Project Incorporated, the uh, Rural Advancement Fund of, of National Sharecroppers Fund, the uh, Concerned Citizens of Tillery right here in North Carolina, um, and the Arkansas Land and Farm Development Corporation. And there was critical input from the Uniform Laws Commission and support from Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts and the National Association of Conservation Districts. Uh, but uh, uh, even, even more than this, land loss has been working in, uh, in collaboration uh, with other uh, organizations uh, in, in that effort. And we call ourselves the Heirs Property Retention Coalition. Uh, this is a, a consortium of organizations and nationwide reach uh, that originally submitted comments during the drafting of the model, national model legislation, the uh, Uniform Heirs, Heirs Property Act, a Uniform Heirs Petition, Pro Property Petition Act that I was talking about earlier. Um, this consorti consortium of organizations submitted comments in the drafting of that model legislation uh, concerning the issue of petition sales. And the uh, Land Loss Prevention Project was asked to be an official observer in the drafting process uh, of the National Conference of Commission, uh, National Conference of Commi Commissioners on uh, Uniform State Laws. Uh, and that, the, back then it was called the Petition of Tennessee and Common and Real Property Act. Um, pursuant to conference procedure, the observers have the op opportunity to uh, participate substantively in committee meetings and are encouraged to submit written comments uh, throughout the process. And on uh, July 15th, 2010, I proposed that uniform state law aimed at preserving home ownership for vulnerable families nationwide was adopted. The uh, Uniform Petition of Heirs Property Act, uh, drafted and approved by the Uniform Law Commission, uh, establishes a number of important protections of owners of heirs property, which we hope to see come to North Carolina in a distant, in a, well, in a, in a very near future. Uh, among those protections adopted by the, the ULC are improved notification practices, 
uh, broader judicial consideration uh, for courts, uh, for example, they can take into, in, into consideration how long the family has owned the land, uh, whether the family uh, would be rendered homeless if the land was sold in a partition sale, uh, what the land really means to the family beyond uh, financial uh, considerations. Um, and the establishment of priorities for a buyout for family members uh, in the interest of an individual requesting sale in the physical division of the land before a for forced par sale would be permitted. Uh, we want to have uh, sales conducted on more of a commercial commercial basis instead of a forced sale uh, uh, set up, much like we see in foreclosures, because it, in that set up, the families aren't able to, they're already being forced to sell the land. And so we want them, if they, the land is being sold, that they, they can get the adequate compensation for what, for what that land means to their family for so many generations. And that's, that's, why, this, that's why this uniform petition of a various property act is so important, and we, we hope to bring it to North Carolina very soon. A lot of people working on it. Um, so, in all our work, you know, land loss is promoting community resilience, because that's that's what we really what we're talking about here, uh, through our advocacy, our outreach, and our policy work. So we know that uh, we have to be ready for the next climate disaster, and we need to we need to strengthen our connections with each other, uh, so that we can survive and thrive. And so, how do we do that? Uh, we promote. At land loss, we promote uh, estate planning. We promote uh, uh, people engaging in estate planning and in communities of color and frontline EJ communities because that's, that's important. Uh, we promote business succession planning for those who own small farming operations that may have been affected by, by floods, uh, those who own uh, other uh, business uh, operations uh, or who want to reclaim. There's, sometimes there's brown, brownfield uh, that's, that's left available after, after storms and, and uh, they may, their land may be available to be claimed in the community. And the vision of the community, uh, hopefully, will be, will be instrumental in how that land is going to be developed. And so people in the community need, need access to, to funding and, and, and things that have been traditionally not been available to them, and so they can redevelop that land, too. Um, and that all encompasses business and estate planning. So we, you know, we start with the basics, the will, and you know, maybe a power of attorney, a, a, tr a trust, or and other kinds of documents to protect the title to the land. But uh, in addition to that, what's also important is, you know, your, your, your body and your, your, medical, your medical care and decisions that, that might need to be made. And unfortunately, when these disasters come through, people are, are, are injured. I mean, we're looking at the news in, in Alabama and there's been a tornado and 23 people have, have lost their lives. And when I, when, I, when I see that news, I'm thinking about um, the sadness in, that, in, the, in those families and I'm thinking about the sadness that can be compounded when they have to they have to go over those people's estates, the people in the families, and decide what's going to happen with, with with what they owned and the and the property that they owned, how that elicits elicits uh, memories and, and pain and, and and things in those family members. When you're already going through a, through a disaster, you want to it's, it, not having those things in place is only going to make make that that pain worse. I know it's not going to go away, but we can do things now to make sure that we, that we can kind of ease that if when we go into those situations and you know with climate change they're, they're, they're getting more powerful and more, more stringent and so we need to estate planning is, is very important especially for in, in communities of color and people of color in indigenous communities um, so uh, uh, I say I would have to say uh, uh, when we talk about body body estate planning uh, I mean uh, advanced directives and and uh, uh, heirs property I mean uh, not uh, I'm sorry, not your property. It's on the mind. Uh, healthcare powers of powers of attorney, so that you can make decisions about how your body's going to be cared for. If you can't do that uh, after you have unfortunately become injured or incapacitated, uh, that's just as important as the will and the, and the trust and the power of attorney to protect the title to the land. Um, also, you know, we want to we we do we engage in the, uh, outreach in the communities um, for you know things like. Uh, uh, helping communities to, to compile lists of resources that are available locally and in, in state on a national level, uh, things that uh, that the resources that, that, that they can avail themselves of in those when those disaster events come through, uh, we we can hope we can host outreach sessions in those communities, and we can talk about estate planning and, and accessing those resources, uh, so that when these things come through, uh, it's not such a such a shock to the community, um, and also uh, the community we want to we want to. Uh, uh, advocate and support the community being an active voice, uh, having a vision in these in this in this uh, 
Uh, we call it a recreation. Uh, last weekend, I was at the Climate Justice Summit, and I'm on a leadership team, and, and some of my beloved team members are in the room here, uh, over here, Elijah, my, my brother cousin over here, my brother over here, and, and we talk about recreation. That's one of the things that we talk about in communities. And recreation involves the, the, the revisioning and the, and, the, and the involvement of the people in the community, just, just what, what Dr. Emanuel was talking about. Um, uh, it, it's, it's important for those people in the community to be involved in that process. Uh, and we saw a, a, a bit of that, an example of that in Princeville, uh, the, uh, you know, one of the most uh, significant communities in the, in, the, uh, in the country. They had a design workshop of, uh, in 2017, I, I had the uh, pleasure to, to attend, where there were uh, officials and stu students and professors from NC State and, and FEMA and the National Park Service and EPA all there uh, uh, pouring over uh, plans and, 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 and putting their heads together so that the community and these professionals uh, could, could uh, uh, come together as, as stakeholders, especially the community members, to, to redesign a uh, future for, for Princeville that, that works for Princeville. Uh, and that's what we wanna see uh, happen all across North Carolina uh, in these communities of color. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank y'all for staying woke. But um, so, well, you know, we had the trip today, and you all got to see a taste of what we deal with here in North Carolina. Well, I'm, first of all, I am co-director and community organizer for the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, and I've been doing the community organizing since 1999. I've been the co-director since 2013, um, and I have the most fun doing the organizing. And, and then I would also like to acknowledge a couple of people in the room, and you know, I'm going to tell you like my pastor say, when you start calling names, that's how you get in trouble. So if I don't call your name, don't let your feelings be hurt. I'm not trying to be omit anybody, but I've, I want to acknowledge Marion Engel, Ingham, Ingle, Lotto Ingleman. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Marion. Anyway, from Earth, huh? Marion from Earth Justice, who uh, we called on a few years ago to come to North Carolina to help us put together to begin. Well, what we really called her was to start talking about what are we going to do with D with Diener the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, when they renew those permits for those contract growers in North Carolina, because their waste management program officer had set out at our annual environmental justice summit and told us that the permits were up for renewal in March and that they would probably be renewed. It didn't matter what she heard in the room that day from communities that were being impacted those permits were going to be renewed. And so at that point, I was like, so what are we going to do about it? And I was like, so we're going to get started now working on what our response is going to be when they renew those permits. And so we got in touch with Miriam, and she came to North Carolina, and we, Steve Wing, Marion, myself, and a few other people sat at the Pizza Hut in Zebulon, and feasted on pizza while we planned what our how our response was going to be. And so as time went on, they renewed those permits, and we had to come out with our response. And, and then they joined ranks with, can I tell y'all, Marilyn, you can stand too, but these two people right here in front of me, I call them the kick-butt lawyers. And I want y'all... <laughs> And that is Elizabeth Haddix and Mark Dawson. And, and when I say that, and I te I'll tell y'all why I say that, because um, as a community organizer with the network, we get communities all around the state of North Carolina calling us for assistance because of something that's getting ready to happen in their community that they don't want to happen and they are concerned about. And so they will call us and say, can you help us? And so then I go and meet with them to hear what it is 
that they are concerned about. Once I get all of the information, I bring it back to the network and we talk about what this issue is and what can we do to assist this community. And I always tell communities right up front, now I have two things to tell you. Number one, um, um, what number one is if we can't save you, but we can assist you. So you have to save yourself. So that means you have to be actively engaged as a community in this battle to prevent or change what's going on. And then I always tell them too, now once you get in, you can't get out. So you sure, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then I also warn them that why they need to attend their local governmental meetings, pay attention to what your zoning boards are doing, your planning boards, your elected officials, because if you're not in the room, you can rest assured you're going to be on the menu. So, you know, so we try to, you know, encourage people to make sure they're in the room and to understand why they need to be in the room. And the evidence is ever present in our communities about why we need to be in the room. But what in all the years that we've been working with Elizabeth and Mark, first they were at the UNC Civil Rights Law Center, and I guess everybody in this room by now know what happened there. I'm gonna tell them so you know it's all right. <laughs> but um Anyway, so, um, but I, you know, ever since I met Elizabeth and Mark and we've been working with them, they had another kick butt lawyer by the name of Peter Gilbert, who is no longer with them, but he's still on our board of the network. And, um, but whenever we call them for a community to come help with the community, in all the years we've been working together, they have never ever said, Naima, we can't, we don't have anybody, we can't do this, we got our hands full. If we call them, you can rest assured they're going to show up. The first thing they say, when is the next meeting? And then I'll contact the community and say, well, we, the lawyers say they can come, they need to know when. And then they will schedule the meeting. And so we'll go back together to that community. But they, they are representing communities that don't look like them, okay? And, but they are coming up against folks that look like them that get food when they walk in the room, and that's what be real good to me. So, because <laughs> they're, you know, we had this community down in Brunswick County, Supply, North Carolina, which is all the way down on the other side of Wilmington. When you get to Supply, you're about 25 miles from Myrtle Beach. So they're stuck between Myrtle Beach and them beaches down there in Wilmington that everybody loves to come to North Carolina and go to. And, but it's an African-American community that Brunswick County is the county seat there. So the Brunswick County uh, elected officials have been picking on this community for years. And they decided, um, at the point they contacted us, they decided that they want to put a landfill there. Well, first they, they had sand mining. And I found this out by talking to the community member because Peter Gilbert called our office and said, Naima, I got this community in Royal Oaks, North Carolina, down in Supply that needs some assistance, and I think the network can help them out. And so I said, well, who do I need to talk to? So he gave me the contact name. I called the person. We was on the phone for about two hours. He was telling me what had been going on. First, they did sand mining in this community, and this is where they had this excavation company come into the community, dig up the dirt to take it down to the beach for beach erosion. And as they did that, the community was 100% well water, so people's wells began drying up. They began seeing changes in what their water was looking like. And they, one lady told me she was having to repurchase her clothes about every three months because her clothes was beginning to shred like paper from washing them in the water since they had been seeing the changes. Um, and then, if that wasn't enough, they built up a, a white community downhill from this com black community, and one of these exclusive communities, you know how they do, and they built it down there, and it had an animal shelter down there, where the white people didn't want the animal shelter. 
So what you think they did with it? I give y'all one good guess. <laughs> so they picked it up and they moved it up to the Royal Oak community. They connected it to the water and sewer, but the people didn't have the water and sewer. And then they needed a waste treatment plant, so they moved that right to the foot of this community. They connected it to the water and sewer, but the people didn't have the water and sewer. So when they said landfill, that's when the community went up in arms and said, wait a minute. You know, it was the, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. So they, that's when they contacted Peter to say, you know, they needed something to happen. So Peter directed them in our direction. So when I talked with them, I said, well, when is your next meeting and is your community involved? Are you talking with everybody in your community? And, you know, are y'all already meeting? Do you ha what have you done? And so we talked, and then um, I said, well, if you could schedule a meeting and make sure you notify everybody in the community, I will come down and meet, and we'll talk about it and see what needs to happen. So we did that, and um, then we notified. When I, after I heard the story, I was like, I already know they need some legal help. And the other thing I told them, I said, y'all good, because I tell you what, every night, every morning when, the, when them people came back, where all them pipes would have been cut up. Because I went and got me some metal colors from somewhere. <laughs> and, you know, so they, um, so we, we called the, we, I notified Peter, and I said, Peter, now I went down and I talked with Mr. Doge and them, and I met with them, and this is what is going on. And then we need another meeting. I need you to go with me. And so he said, okay, just let me know when the next meeting is. I did that. We went back down and met with them. And the community became organized, and they started meeting on a monthly basis, and they were talking and showing up at their governmental, you know, at their um, commissioner meetings and paying attention to everything going on around them. And the, and the Brunswick County commissioners went in shock because this community they done picked on all these years had never said a word. Now they speaking up. They don't know what's wrong with these black people. What's wrong with them? They talking like this to us, you know. So they didn't, they were very disturbed. So anyway, it wind up, so they wind up with this landfill battle and um, it had to go to court because the community was taking the commissioners to court because they were insisting on having this landfill. My time is up already. And it, okay, so let me speed up. <laughs> so um, anyway, so they, so anyway, we, they wind up having to go to court. Peter and them was, re the Civil Rights Law Center was representing them. And that what tickled me is when they got to court, I said, y'all fooled that Brunswick County real good because they went in court and this, this local government was all white on a predominantly African-American town. And they weren't used to, you know, these people fighting back. So they were already in shock. And then they saw, you know, Peter and them come into court, Peter and Elizabeth, and they saw white faces that looked just like them. So they was like, oh, yeah, they probably just going to pretend. This is what I said now. I didn't hear them say this, but I can only imagine that because of the way they behave is when they saw them, they probably felt like, oh, they just going to probably pretend to be representing them. You know that fake stuff that Trump talk about? Yeah, they, they just going to be faking like they representing them. And I told them, I said, and then this court started. They called it the order, and the judge did his thing. And Elizabeth and Peter pulled out them guns, and they were blazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Brunswick County didn't know what had happened to them. <laughs> and they got so ticked off, they fired their attorneys because Peter... <laughs> Peter and them made those attorneys look like they were just, you know, more ignorant than what we see coming out the White House these days. <laughs> but anyway, to make a long story short, they kicked butt down there in Brunswick County. And the, and the people down there, the, you know, the royal community, they still standing tall with their chest stuck out. And Brunswick County still pissed off with them, you know, but they, um, they learned a lesson from that. But, you know, this, I, so I said all that to say that, you know, now we wind up in another battle. It's a fight we've been fighting for years with the pork industry in North Carolina. 
And that's a long story. I don't have enough time to give y'all all the details. So I'm going to cut through the chase and say, because of a Title VI complaint that the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network reached organization where we were today and the Waterkeeper Alliance, we formed a coalition way back in 2006 and been working together ever since, um, came together and filed a Title VI complaint against DENA, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, for their lack of regulating and ringing in this pork industry in North Carolina. And we was like, they are so beholden to this industry that they couldn't make them do anything different. They weren't even trying to trying to make them do anything different. So we was like, so y'all don't do nothing. We fed up with y'all, so we just going to get y'all. And you can deal with the pork industry any way you want to. And uh, anyway, so we filed a Title VI complaint against them. We filed a Title VI complaint, and we got notified by EPA. We got It was accepted. Then they sent us a letter saying, now, this is the process. If you, go, if you get a complaint, it gets accepted. You have a uh, opportunity to do what they call alternative dispute resolution, which ain't nothing but a fancy word for mediation. And so you, you can do mediation with the parties involved and try to reach a resolution on, you know, together, or the EPA, EPA would have to do their job. And so we decided to give mediation a try. And um, we took a while to get to the to, to an agreement on the mediator and a date for the mediation. And so in the process of all of this, uh, EPA Office of Civil Rights, where we filed a complaint, got a letter from the national pork producers saying, we understand that this case is in, this complaint is in mediation. We don't understand why we didn't get notified, why we not party to the mediation, you know. And, um, and so they sent it to Marion's office, and she sent it out to all of us. And we looked at it, and the first time, when I opened my email and saw that, and I said, my first response was, how the hell they know about this mediation? Because it's supposed to have been a confidential process according to the rules that the EPA sent out to all of us, to Dina and to all of us, that this was a confidential process. We were not to talk about it. And so I'm like, how the hell they know about it if it's confidential and they not party to it? And then I said, did EPA tell them or did Dina tell them? So then I said this all to Marion, and I said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, if they come in the room, NCJN is walking, because we're not talking to no pork people, because they not party to this. We are talking about the lack of the regula regulations in this state and how they have not reigned in this industry. And this is not about the industry's business. This is about the regulatory system. And so um, Marion sent them the response back, letting them know you are not welcome to this process. You are not party to it. There's no place at the table for it. Our clients don't want you in the room. You can't be there. And she sent it out to them, to Dina, to us, to EPA. And so, you know, once I saw that, I was fine. I was like, okay, so we go into mediation. Everything's good to go. And then we got to the day of mediation, and it was being held at the Civil Rights Law Center. So I drive from Rocky Mountain to Chapel Hill as fast as I could get there without getting a ticket. <laughs> and I get there, and I get out of my car, and there's these two white men sitting in the car staring at me. And I was like, what are y'all looking at? And I did like that and went on and went on up the steps, and I got inside. I told them, I said, y'all, the port council is out there in the parking lot. And by the time I said that, the mediator came running in the room from the other side, and he said, uh, the port council's out there. They want to know, can they come in? Hell no, we told them that already. We told you that already. So what are you coming in here asking us for? They can't come in. And so, um, and then so the dinner was there at the time. And so they, them and their lawyers, the staff from Dina and their attorney, they were in the room. And so they got, they were out, they went in the hallway and they were out there in the hallway. I had to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. They stand out there with the pork people and they all laughing and slapping <laughs> each other around. And I was like, this right here is why we can't get nothing done. 
right here. This right here is why we can't get nothing done about this. And so to cut the story short as I possibly can without without y'all not being able to catch the details, um, Elizabeth went out there and, and told them it was two people from North Carolina Port Council. They had flew in somebody from the National Port Producer who had been told don't come, and they drove in from Charlotte to Chapel Hill after they'd been told not to come. They all out there together with Dina laughing and hee-hawing and patting and playing with each other. And Elizabeth went out there and told them they needed to leave, and they did not like it. So they were standing out there trying to, you know, all suited up with their suit and ties, looking like just who they were. And Elizabeth said, well, you have to leave. You have to get out of our building. They didn't want to go. And she said, and, and see, this is just what white supremacy do. do. You know, you come in and you just think you can take over and take charge, you know, and, and don't nobody have to do nothing but whatever you think. Dina got mad. If this is the kind of name calling you're going to be doing, we're going to leave. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, you acting just like them. So, uh, you know, because they got ticked off. Anyway, she put them out of the building. And from that began their moment of we're going to get you. If it's the last thing we do, we're going to get you. And so they, one, Steve Long from the National Port, from the North Carolina Port Council sent a letter to the Board of Governors at the UNC Civil Rights System saying, you got to stop these lawyers from doing this litigation work. And, well, then they already see on record, and they, and I'm sure the Port people already knew this, everybody they represent, they done kicked their butts. And they were all just like y'all, you know. And so, you know, and they all represent these little black towns. So now you got to stop this stuff. You can't be doing this, for, you know, be winning these battles with black people like this because they might think they got some power. That's probably what they were thinking. So anyway, to make a long story short, um, they put them out. And then come November of last year, the Civil Rights Law Center terminated Elizabeth and Mark. Um, from the, and they are no longer at the Civil Rights Law Center, but don't get depressed because they now have the Julius Chambers Civil Rights Law Center. And they need... <laughs> they need our support. They need our support because they are having to raise their own funds to keep the center going. Y'all cut my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm getting ready to be done. And so, and then we have Leslie Hatfield, my friend from New York, the Grace Foundation here, who has um, really become a dear friend, and, and we talk almost every day, and, you know, we're in this battle together, and it takes many of us, many pieces, and it takes all of us. You know, we say it today in the room. Um, I remember when I said to Devon, don't tell him about the link in the chain. Well, the link in the chain is the way we close every meeting, community meeting that we have, and our annual summit where we have everybody in the room, form a circle, join hands, and you say, I'm a link in the chain. The link in the chain will not break here. That's our statement of solidarity and commitment to each other to stay connected and to stay involved. And when you come into our atmosphere and into our rooms, that's, that includes you. So now we expect to see all of y'all some more. And I'm Thank you. Thank you, darling. So I don't know how to tell short stories, so I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> it's important stories. All of these stories are important. So what, what do they have in common, right? Unlike many other communities, these communities and communities like them all over the country are fighting battles on multiple levels. They're fighting local government that discounts them, discounts their interests, and, and willingly violates the law. They're fighting state government who make up law as they go along. They decide which laws they want to enforce and where they want to enforce them, and they pick and choose as opposed to equal protection for all communities before the law. And they're fighting the federal government, right? So they've been fighting the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Department of Transportation for how many years? Uh, it's over 25 years. Of course, we can talk about the millennia that indigenous people have been fighting this 
so-called government. But here in North Carolina, the Lumbee people have been fighting the state of North Carolina, the local county government, as well as the federal government, right? All along about everything that has to do with them. Um, Omari talked about the battles with the, with the Department of Agriculture and so many other entities, but there's one bright spot, and Omari, Omari lifted it up. Um, in all of the craziness that happened last year and that continues to happen this year, in the shutdown of the federal government, everybody slept on the passage of the Farm Bill, right? And the many, many, many progressive provisions that were included in the Farm Bill that were brought about because so many great people worked together, including uh, people who represent um, rural districts and agricultural districts in other parts of the country, they all came together. But I really want to lift up the rural coalition and landlords for giving us the one freaking victory that we had last year, which was the Farm Bill. And I just want to pound the table and, 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 and raise that up. And then the long-standing battle that folks have had here in North Carolina. So we watch what goes on in North Carolina because it's a bellwether of how damn crazy people are going to get, right? That's if it's right. going to get right. butt wild crazy, they're going to try it in North Carolina, right. right? And most of the time it works, unfortunately, right? And what stops it from working is powerful, informed, educated people at every level, at the most local level, who Naima said, go to the meetings. When the zoning board is meeting, show yourself up and bring everybody you know, because it's you and your lives and your livelihood that they're talking about and they're dissecting, so you need to go, right? It's the legislature who decides that, well, we don't like the fact that they got powerful lawyers who are bringing and doing stuff, so we're just going to change the whole law, right? And let's not sleep on the North Carolina uh, ninth um, congressional district race, right? Yeah. How many people went to jail so far? Five people. Five people going to jail. Vote still. <laughs> right? Still counting votes. Um, those issues are all related. And so when you work in the EJ space, you got to work across a lot of different arenas. Right? You can't really zero in on one thing. You got to do all things. And then let's not forget what Ryan said about the battle with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. This Atlantic Coast Pipeline is a monster. But if you look at the map for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, it's like they looked at every freaking community of color from Pennsylvania That's to right. South Carolina. And the, the, it's not a straight line. It's That's not that, you know, the most, they tell you in geometry the most direct path, right, from A to B. But this one is going like this, like that, over here, over there, everywhere. They're picking up all the communities of color, and that's where the pipeline is going, as well as poor and working class white communities. Major battles are happening here in North Carolina that have implications for the whole country. And I just want to thank our panelists and thank the organizers of this event for setting us on the right path. Just know that what happens in North Carolina sets the pace for the rest of the country. And it's crazy, batshit crazy stuff is going on in North Carolina. But these are the people who are bringing it and their lawyers. Thank you all. Uh, before...